In this lecture, we are going to be looking at the theater, and this is again meant to accompany your reading from the Spore textbook, so please have the chapter read before listening to the lecture. First thing I'd like you to do, on this slide you see there is a, a YouTube clip. Please watch this uh, video. What it is, is it is a video of the 2013 opening ceremonies or opening um, performance for the Tony Awards. Uh, the Tony Awards are the awards given to live theater. So please watch that and then continue with the rest of the lecture. The reason why I have you watch this is to get this idea, even though anything we are looking at through these lectures, through these clips are recorded, it gives you the idea of a live performance. When Neil Patrick Harris performed this, not only was he performing it live on stage to the audience, but this was also televised around the world, so there were millions of viewers. And the reason that we look at theater separately is there's something distinctly different about a live performance, whether it's a theatrical performance, a musical performance, a dance, there's something different about it. Even think about when you go to a concert and you see the same band time after time, each performance there's something different. You also have a level of freedom in live performance that we don't have when we're watching film, when we're watching television. When we watch those, we have to look at where the camera is pointed. In a live performance, you can look wherever you want. You can be watching what's going on on the stage. You could be watching the audience. You could be watching anything. It's up to you. And also with a live performance, there's always a chance that something could go wrong. What happens if all of a sudden the lights go out or the audio doesn't work or an actor forgets their lines? There's always this chance of disaster, and it's something that has to be dealt with immediately. When we're filming things, we can stop and take it again. But in live performance, you have one shot. So I want you to think about the, some of these things when we are looking at theater and live performance. But first, we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about some of the formal and technical qualities of the theater. Um, theater represents an attempt to reveal a vision of human life through time, sound, and space. Often the theater is an imitation of reality. What we have in theater is the drama, which is the written script, and we always have some sort of interpretation between the written script and the performance, meaning we have actors on stage who are interpreting the written word and performing them for the audience. Um, the term theater actually comes from the Greek theatro, which means the part of the theater where the audience sat. Literally, it means a place for seeing. And again, it's not just referring to a geographic location of the audience, but to see, including comprehending and understanding. And think of it this way. What is a theater production without an audience? An audience is a necessary part of the production. And theater is also an interpretive discipline meaning that you are interpreting the words of the original writer and the audience is then interpreting the actors in the performance. In your textbook, you then look at different types of genres and we'll discuss these briefly here. Um, first, we have the tragedy. Tragedy commonly thought of as a work with an unhappy ending. Usually the playwright makes a statement about human frailty and failing, and we have what's called the tragic hero. Our tragic hero has a tragic flaw, and this tragic flaw is some sort of defect that causes them to contribute to their own downfall. For example, in Oedipus Rex, or Oedipus the King, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Sophocles play, what happens in this, this is an example of a Greek tragedy, and when Oedipus was born, there was an oracle that stated that he was going to grow up to murder his father and marry his mother. Well, the king and queen of Thebes did not want this to happen, and so they sent the baby Oedipus off to be murdered. Well, in all cases, when we send the baby off to be killed, the person who's supposed to kill them never kills them. So what happens is Oedipus is given to another family, and he grows up and has a happy life. However, once he's older, he learns of the oracle. Well, he loves his parents, and he doesn't want to kill his father and marry his mother, so he leaves. And he does this again to save his family. 
Well, as he's traveling, he comes across a group of people on the road, and he actually ends up getting in a fight with an individual, and he kills this man. And then he continues on his way, and eventually he gets to Thebes. While he's in Thebes, he gets to Thebes, and the town is in disarray. They have the Sphinx, who is terrorizing the town, and the king is gone. The king is missing. Well, what happens is Oedipus actually solves the riddle of the Sphinx. Because of this, the Sphinx is defeated, and he marries the queen there because the king again has disappeared. For a long time, he is a happy ruler. Um, he and the new queen, Jocasta, have children together. Well, what ends up happening, though, is Oedipus can't let things lie. He wants to know what happened to the former king. He wants to search and find the truth. Well, this actually ends up being his tragic flaw, the need to find the truth. Because what ends up happening is he ends up discovering that the man he had killed on the road was actually the king of Thebes. And so he was the one who had murdered him. And then he also finds out about the original oracle was a about him was about the king and queen of Thebes' son. And he realizes in that moment that he was actually their son. So what has happened? He actually killed his father and married his mother. And with his need to find the truth, that's how they found this. What happens is he goes and he finds Jocasta, his wife. She has learned of this and she has hung herself. He takes from her a brooch, and he actually takes the brooch and stabs his own eyes out. And then he spends the last years of his life just wandering aimlessly around um, with his daughter Antigone to help him. But because of this, this tragic flaw, this need to know the truth, doesn't sound like a bad thing. But in the end, it's actually what brings Oedipus to his ultimate destruction. All right, the next genre we're going to look at is comedy. Comedy deals with light or amusing subjects or with very serious and profound subjects in a light, um, familiar, or satirical way. It dates back to the 5th century BCE um, with the Greek uh, Aristophanes. Best example of this is the Lysistrata. The Lysistrata is focusing on war between Athens and Sparta. And there's a series of three different wars between these two Greek city-states. And what happens is the women are sick of the fighting. They want it to end. So what they decide to do to get the men to declare peace is they decide to withhold sex. Well, what happens? It works. Eventually, peace is declared, the war is over, and everyone goes off to celebrate. Um, within comedy, usually we think about these um, in the Middle Ages. They shifted. Comedy reappears more as a story with a happy ending. And then your textbook gives a list of different types of comedy, such as comedy of character, comedy of manner, comedy ideas, romantic comedy, and so on. If I were you, I would make sure I read through that list. Next, we have the tragic comedy. This is a mixture of the two forms. Seems something like, well, we were really putting tragedy and comedy together. Well, early tragic comedies were more serious plays that ended if not necessarily happily, then at least avoiding complete catastrophe. Later in time, these plays shifted mood from light to heavy, or in which endings are neither exclusive tragic nor comic. And an example of this would be Samuel Beckett's play Happy Days, which was first performed in 1961. And when this play ends, we don't really have any resolution. We're still just left with the main character, Winnie, just standing there. And I've provided you the first clip on this page. This is a link to a short uh, clip from that play, so please watch that. The next we have is what's called the melodrama. Again, this is a mixed form. It developed in the 18th century, and originally the dialogue took place against a musical background. In the 19th century, these became more serious plays without music. What happens in the melodrama is they use stereotypical characters involved in serious situations in which suspense, pathos, terror, and occasionally hatred are aroused. Usually it is a battle of good versus evil in very exaggerated circumstances. And if you think about the melodrama on television, the most obvious forms of this are the television soap operas. Um, melodramas are usually geared towards popular audiences, 
and we almost have a clear hero battling an external foe. There is no, there are no inner demons. And what happens in the end is that we have the hero is saved at the end. An example of this, I give you another clip, is Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Phantom of the Opera, um, which first premiered in 1986. Um, we also have what's called performance art. This is a later 20th century production, and what happens in performance art is it very intentionally pushes the limits of traditional theater. Um, and it's done in a variety of ways. These began in what's called the happenings, which grew out of the 1960s pop, pop art movement, and they were, again, designed as critiques of American theater and critiques of the consumer culture. And we'll discuss this um, a little bit later in one of our other lectures. All right, we also have what's called the musical. The musical can be completely sung, such as opera, or it can be a combination of spoken word with musical numbers. And it can cover any style, from comedy, tragedy, to melodrama. Um, George Gershwin wrote works that pleased a public audience, and many of these, when we think of musicals, we think of those Broadway musicals. And here I've also given you a couple different clips of different musicals. The four, first is from Porgy and Bess. Um, this one is actually from a revival of it that was done in 2013. And the other clip is from West Side Story of 1957, which was an updated version of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet that's set in New York, New York City where instead of two dueling families from Verona, it pits two rival gangs, the Italians and the Puerto Ricans, against one another. The clip provided is America from the 2009 revival. All right, next we're going to briefly look at some different elements of the production. First, you have the script, which is the written document, which contains the dialogue and the stage directions used by the actors. Language helps to create the overall tone and style of the play, and often we have monologues or soliloquies which are used to tell the audience the character's inner thoughts. Next we have the plot, which is the structure of the play, and in most productions we have what we call the climactic pyramid, meaning that the dynamics of the play rise in intense intensity until they reach the ultimate crisis, or the climax. Then what happens is these tensions decrease through the resolution and then the denouement, which means the wrapping up of loose ends. We have what's called the exposition, and this provides necessary background information. Usually this is done at the beginning of the play, and it can be provided in a variety of ways, through the dialogue of the characters, through narration, the setting, symbolism, scenery, lighting, and so on. Um, and then with this, we also have what's called the point of attack. And this is where the playwright begins the story. In a play, we have what's called the complication, and this is the problem. And then we also have crises, and these are a series of conflicts and decisions that rise in intensity and that ultimately lead to the climax. And then after the climax, we have the denouement, which is French for untangling, and this leads to the final resolution. This is after the climax and where we have the intensity lessening at this point. Also within a theatrical work, we usually have foreshadowing. This helps move the play forward by hinting towards events that will occur later. Um, think about in Jaws, when you hear the music, you know there's an attack going to happen. In Dracula, a production that is often put on in Louisville, I believe by the Actors Theater around Halloween, anytime somebody's going to die, the lights go off. So you know that when the lights go off, someone's dying. Okay. Um, we also have what's called discovery, and this is how information is revealed, and it can be about the characters, their personalities, relationships, and feelings. And then also what's called a reversal, and this is any turn of fortune. Within the play, with the characters themselves, when we talk about the character of a character, we're looking at their psychological motivation of the people in the play, meaning why are they doing what they're doing. And this, of course, also refers to the actors, uh, the roles the actors are playing. 
We have the protagonist, who is our main character the work centers around. Now, this does not mean our protagonist is our good guy. Our focus could be on the so-called bad guy, but the protagonist is our main character. Then we have what's called a foil. A foil is a character who accentuates or contrasts the quality of the protagonist. Example, Dr. Watson to Sherlock Holmes, right? Think of the older versions and not just the newer Robert Downey Jr., Jude Law one, but think more of the obtuse Dr. Watson who makes Holmes seem even more brilliant. And that's an example of a foil. Themes within a production, it's what the production is about, not the plot, but the overreaching ideas, examples, loneliness, love, loyalty, and so on. Um, the visual elements, we have the mise-en-scene, which is all elements of the production put together. And then we have the physical relationship between the actors and the audience. And here we're going to spend a little more time looking at different theater types or stage designs. And here we have three main types, and they all have specific advantages and disadvantages. The first is what you see here, which is called the arena form, or sometimes it's referred to as a theater in the round. What happens in this is that you have the stage in the middle and the audience surrounds it on all four sides. When you look at this, there's definitely advantages and disadvantages here. With this, you can, an example of an advantage is you could definitely probably fit more people in the audience because it surrounds the stage on all four sides. Possible disadvantages, you can't have large props, you can't have background scenery, because if you had something like that, you would be cutting off um, the view of some of the audience. Also another disadvantage of this is at some time, the actor is going to have their back to part of the audience, because remember, the audience is again on all four sides. However, an advantage is the aesthetic distance, meaning the space between the audience and the acting area is very small in this, meaning the audience is right there almost as part of the production themselves, and so they may feel as if they are part of the production. I want you to spend time thinking about some other advantages and disadvantages you can see of the arena stage. The next is what's called the thrust theater, and in this theater, what you can see is that the stage seems to be thrust into the audience. The audience surrounds the stage on three sides, and you have a smaller backstage area. An advantage of this, we still have that smaller aesthetic distance. Why? Because three out of four sides, the audience is directly by the stage, yet we do have that back area. Because of this area with one side without the audience, you could put up background scenery, you could put larger props there. Um, if something goes wrong, an actor can maybe a little more easily get off stage instead of in the arena the arena stage where if an actor leaves or comes on the stage, it's quite obvious. Um, other disadvantages with this is that if you think about where your seats are, if you're one of the seats on the very edge, you could actually see into the backstage area and that might shatter the illusion of the play. Some advantages to this type of play is that we know there's a side without the audience, so the actors can make sure that their backs are never to the audience. However, we're going to see them more at angles depending again where your seats are. And then the final type is what's called the proscenium stage or the frame. Now within this one, the audience is all on one side and the audience all has the same angle. Like look at the image here. We look through the frame of the stage to where the action is. Some advantages of this, you can have props, you can have scenery. Um, you don't have to worry about having your back to the audience because really the audience is only on one side. However, the aesthetic distance here is very far, meaning the audience knows they are not part of the production, that they are literally watching it through the frame. 
And it's only when this fourth wall is intentionally shattered that the audience becomes part of the production. For example, if you've ever seen The Lion King, at the very beginning, some of the animals walk through the theater, then up onto the stage. And this brings the audience almost as part of it, which is rare in this frame theater, because again, usually it frames the performance as we're watching it. And again, keep thinking of different advantages and disadvantages of these different types of stages. All right, quickly we're going to look at some of the production elements. Um, again, make sure you have, <clears throat> excuse me, read this in your book. But different things include the scene design, because when we are looking at a live production, everything is meant to give you information. When you go to a play and you look at the scenery, it can help you tell when and where the production is taking place. Costuming can tell us things, where our characters are, what their background are. Um, with scene design, again, helps to create an environment suitable for achieving the aims of the production. And lighting is key to this. Lighting design, it almost sculpts with lights, and it usually serves four main functions or purpose. First is selective visibility. It helps the audience see what is important at the time, and then it also helps direct the focal point. Imagine a spotlight on somebody. If there's a spotlight on one person and everything else gets dark, we know as the audience that is where we're supposed to be looking. Lighting also helps with rhythm and structure, meaning it helps to move the play along and can ind indicate a rise and fall in action. So when the lights start getting dim, we know something is usually coming to a conclusion. Also, lighting can help with mood. It is a major clue to the atmosphere of the play. If you go in and everything's very bright with warm yellows, warm gold lights, it's going to give a mood more of happiness, of warmth. Instead of if you go in and it's light blues, light greens, silvery colors, that would give it a much cooler, much darker. Or if you go in and there's very dramatic use of light and shade, lots of dark spaces, red overtone, it's going to give it that eerie, sinister feel to it. So again, the lighting can help create the mood. And then finally, the lighting can help with illusion and motivation. Again, helping the audience experience the time and place of action. So if we want to indicate that time is moving forward, maybe we have it brighter, and then as it gets dimmer, dimmer, dimmer to dark, and then from dark, brighter again, that's supposed to represent the idea of the sun setting and then rising. So it tells us the passage of time. Again, costume design, very important. And this is not just limited to clothing. It includes hair and makeup. Again, these costume elements have specific purposes. Um, they can help accent a character, showing the audience who, who the most important characters in the production are. Usually your most important characters are going to have the most elaborate costuming. Um, the coloring is probably going to be brighter or bolder than the other characters. And your characters that are more background, if you pay attention to them, their outfits are probably very basic and dollar drabber colors. Why? Because the audience is supposed to be watching the most important characters. This also can help reflect. Um, it can help show the setting of the production. If you had people who walked out in full Elizabethan gear, you would know what time place this was supposed to be taken in. If people walked out wearing cowboy boots and cowboy hats, that would probably give you a hint of location. And also, again, it reveals, it can reveal specific information about the characters. Costume design can be analyzed individually and as part of the whole production using the elements and principles of composition we've discussed earlier. Um, and then props. Props are very important. Props are the tools the actors use. We have set props, which includes things such as furniture, pictures, rugs. These also help the audience understand the setting better. And then we have hand props. These are items used by the actors to help portray the character. 
And then we have what's called the oral elements. And then this is something that we hear, it's audio. And this is what the audience themselves hear. It can include the actors' voices, background music, sound effects, and so on. And like everything else we've discussed, it's used to help create the atmosphere and to give the audience necessary information. The dynamics of a work, we're talking about the volume and intensity that's used throughout the production to build a dynamic pattern to help maintain the audience's attention. And then the actors. The actors themselves are so important because, again, the actors are the ones that are interpreting the written work and they are trying to perform it in a way so the audience understands. Think about how an actor delivers their lines. If an actor, if you walked into a Shakespearean production and you heard, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears, right? it would dramatically change the work itself. So that is very important. And then we have what's called the spine. The spine is the basic motivation behind an actor's portrayal of the character. So if somebody chooses to use a country accent, the spine would be the motivation and the reason of why the actor did this. All right. Well, then what I want you to do is I've provided three different clips here. Definitely look at the first clip. This is, it's from a, the Tonys again. The reason I have this is because it's a recording of a live performance. And this is from The Man of La Mancha. And I want you to watch, if at least you watch any of them, watch this one. Um, pay attention to all of these elements. The costuming, the lighting, and Think about how if you had to analyze this, give it a formal an analysis, what elements and principles of, of composition would you use to discuss this? The second clip is Lea Sagan's I Dreamed a Dream, I Dreamed a Dream from Les Mis. And then the third clip is from Sam um, is from Waiting for Godot, and this is Lucky Speech, and this is not a musical production. But again, even just quickly look at it, looking at the staging, the lighting, the costuming, can help you see and understand the background of each of these um, performances. So please watch those and be prepared if somebody were to ask you what formal elements you would talk about um, to discuss these.